Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua Batts. I'm a postdoctoral research associate here at the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at Cambridge University. Um, and I specialize in Japanese history. In fact, that's one of the papers that I teach here. Uh, traces Japan's history from prehistoric times all the way to the present. Uh, and in that class, I introduce students to a variety of different kinds of primary sources, often texts, poems, uh, chronicles, literature. Uh, but I also make an effort to introduce students in that course to visual sources, which I think are useful to help students think about different ways of seeing things, not just reading, but seeing. Uh, and to that point, in this video today, in this brief introductory kind of taster lecture, I thought I would introduce a couple of maps from Japan's Tokugawa period, that is to say the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s. Um, in particular, these maps are going to be talking about or showing, I'm going to be showing you maps of Japan, which is the entire realm, and then also a couple of maps detailing Tokugawa, Japan's most famous road or highway. And the hope is that this will get you to understand a little bit um, about how people in different times and places thought about the space around them and how they encoded that space uh, into geographic information, what was deemed important information, what was deemed useful information and how that process might have looked a couple of hundred years ago in a different society, but also maybe helping you think about what that process looks like today in your own. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so our first map is here. This is obviously not a map from the Tokugawa period. This is a, this is a format I think that you recognize even if you haven't looked at this view. This is what Japan looks like if you were to search for it in Google Maps today. I just wanted to introduce a couple of points here to help contextualize the map we'll be looking at in a second. Uh, the first element here is, is labeled information. What is labeled for you? Might seem very basic, but right, we've got countries are labeled, Japan, North Korea, South Korea, cities, Sapporo, Sendai, Seoul, and then bodies of water. You can see the Sea of Japan is named, the East China Sea is named. Uh, but there are other elements that you're already encoding and looking at here that are not labeled. For example, the color blue represents water. You know that. Nothing in the map tells you that, but you know that blue is water. Uh, and you also know that that light tan color must represent land. And if you look closely, you'll see uh, little patches of green here and there uh, that probably represent um, natural areas or forest preserves. Now, uh, the other thing I want to point out here, an additional point specific to Google as well, or specific to maps these days, especially those that are digital, is that there's a, they are now layered and interactive. You've got this kind of whole host of other information available to you on the left-hand side of the screen. You can peruse photos, I suppose, representative of Japan. You can click through to Wikipedia and find out some more quick facts about it. You can, uh, within a few keystrokes, you can navigate your way within Japan, find directions from place A to place B, and we all have used uh, Google Maps and searches before. You can, if you want, of course, also use this to say, uh, find out what the most highly reviewed ramen restaurant in Sapporo is. Or similarly, you could uh, use this interface to help find out where the best cup of coffee in Nagui is, among many, many other functions. Uh, the last thing I want to point out here might also seem basic, but the Japan that we're looking at today, uh, it comprises many islands, but physically, um, physically what's happening the main islands that we see here, uh, coming from the north down to the south, we've got Hokkaido is here on the uh, northeast side, and then we have the big island or the main island here, Honshu. Uh, we have a smaller island here, Shikoku, and then we have Kyushu, and then stretching down on the bottom left here, we see Okinawa, the archipelago uh, constituting present-day Okinawa. So that's how Japan looks today. Let's go ahead and see how Japan may have looked 300 years ago, according to map makers and cartographers at that time. Okay, so now we're at the good stuff. This is a map from about 300 years ago, right around 1700, uh, and it's titled Nihon Sankai Zudo Taizen. If you translate that roughly, it would be a complete map of Japan's uh, mountains, waters, and roads. And you can see we're looking at something very different. Japan looks very different. It's much more squiggly than what we were seeing before with the earlier view uh, in Google Maps. But you can also tell there's a lot of information present. Um, there are labels galore. There's lots of little writing that obviously you cannot see at this level of zoom. 
Uh, but just to go over a couple of things, we see that Japan is divided into different provinces and areas. You can see those kind of borders shaded here. Uh, there are labels for major towns and cities. And then you'll also see a bit of the road network winding its way through Japan as well. So there's plenty of information, plenty of useful stuff going on here, even if the shape doesn't have, uh, doesn't adhere to the latitude and longitude that we're used to imposing on our views of most maps today. Uh, the other thing I want to point out, or the first thing I want to draw your attention to here, though, is that Japan itself is also different. What constitutes Japan 300 years ago is different politically uh, and thus geographically. So most importantly, uh, if we were, remember we were looking at the Google map earlier, um, Japan had four main islands, and then I pointed out the archipelago of Okinawa. Well, here we're down to three. We have the main island of Honshu here, we have Shikoku here, and we have Kyushu here. Uh, but present-day Hokkaido and Okinawa are not included in the same way. They've been pushed out to the corners, quite literally. So up here in the top right, we have uh, what we now call Hokkaido, the northernmost island in Japan. At the time, 300 years ago, it was called Ezo. Um, and then here on the opposite corner, way down in the south, uh, kind of in the bottom left here, Present-day Okinawa is here labeled the Kingdom of Ryukyu. And uh, both um, Ezo in the north and Ryukyu in the south had kind of a complicated relationship with the Tokugawa shogunate, with the political entities of Japan. But as this map shows you, they were not considered integral. They're not considered a central part of Japan itself at that time. They were added to uh, Japan officially uh, in the 19th century. Here, their relationship is different, and their place on the map reflects that. What I find particularly interesting is that they've been purposely excluded and purposely included. Uh, if that sounds strange to you, what I mean by that is um, geography has been compressed to make sure that they're present on the map, but only on the margins. So if you were to zoom in, um, we're here on the top right, there's a notation saying that the land of Ezo is about a two day sail from the northern tip of Honshu. So this space is actually much bigger than it looks here, but the map maker made sure to include it. Uh, similarly, down here in the bottom left with Ryukyu or Okinawa, there's a notation saying that the northern part of Ryukyu is about 260 D, which would be maybe five or 600 miles away from the southern tip of Kyushu. So again, space is being compressed uh, to make sure that those two areas were included, uh, but also uh, in a way that makes it very clear that they are not a central part of Japan, because at the time, they were not. So now let's take a look uh, briefly at some external locations to Japan then and now. So if you look up at the top left, we actually have this is uh, the Korean Peninsula butting in. So the Kingdom of Korea is being referenced here. And then there are a couple of real life kind of foreign places or locales that are referenced but not present on the map. That's here in this box you see a little bit to the right, Korea. This is actually uh, giving a list of sailing distances from the port of Nagasaki in Japan to various uh, locations around the world of interest to Japanese at this time, that is to say around 1700. So just a couple examples from this box. According to the map, Nanking is about, Nanking in China is about 300 feet away. Uh, the northern Philippines, or the island in the, in the northern part of the Philippine archipelago is about 1100 feet away. And then the Netherlands, remember the Dutch at this time were trading out of Nagasaki. The Dutch are listed as being over 22,000 feet away. So even if they're not present on the map, these foreign locations are represented in terms of information. Now the final category, there are actually is a place here that is not real. There's a, there's a mythological or an imaginative place here. And that is down here on the bottom, right again, right here on the edge of the border, right? It pokes into the map. There's this island, uh, landmass, two names, Rasetsukoku uh, and Nyojima, which translate roughly to the Island of Demonic Women or just the Island of Women? There's two different names there. Uh, apparently the Island of Demonic Women was inhabited by, as it would sound, cannibalistic uh, female demons that would eat anyone who showed up. So we have both the real um, and the imaginative mixing here on this map. So in closing, when looking at this map, I think it's, it's a good exercise in thinking about the difference between accuracy and utility. If I were to ask you what makes for a good map or a useful map today, we would probably say that it was accurate. Um, but an, 
accuracy and utility do not always overlap, at least in the way that we think about it now. This map is quite useful, even if it's not accurate in the way uh, that the digital projection we were looking at, the contemporary digital projection we were looking at earlier, um, displayed. There's all kinds of useful information here that we have just barely scratched the surface on. Uh, for example, the names of all the Japanese provinces and all the counties within the provinces are here in this table. Uh, names of the different road stations, rest stops, if you will, or uh, towns along the way of major roads are down here. Um, so in fact, Japan in the early 1800s got very good at mapping its coastline, but this kind of projection, less accurate, but chock full of information about places and distances, uh, remained popular throughout the Tokugawa period. Now, the next couple of maps that we're going to look at are actually going to focus in on the main road in Japan, which connected Edo over here uh, with Kyoto and Osaka over here. And it's this Tokaido, this eastern sea road that you can see kind of winding its way uh, around Japan along the coast. And the next couple of maps that we'll look at, we'll be looking at, at that road in particular. So let's go ahead and take a look at them. Okay, so now we're looking at two maps uh, side by side. So the map on the right is called the Tōkaido Gōjūtsan Sugi Michi Annai, or Guide to the 53 Stations on the Eastern Sea Road. Uh, and on the left, uh, the map we're looking at is the um, Tōkaido Gyōretsu Sugoroku, um, which I suppose roughly translated would be a, a board game of a procession along the Eastern Sea Road. Um, now, you can see uh, one reason why on the previous map I kind of outlined that same road, the Tokaido. It's on the coast, it's in the name, Eastern Sea Road. Uh, but you can see what these two maps have done. The road zigzags back and forth, right? There's no fidelity to how it, quote unquote, looks really, how it really looks, or geographical accuracy. You can see on the left here, we start, this is uh, the Tokaido actually linked the city of Edo with the city of Kyoto. So on the left, uh, it zags down here from the bottom right, and you can kind of trace the road as it winds back and forth all the way up. Now, interestingly, uh, the map on the right is doing the same thing. It actually does it in the opposite direction. Here, Edo is up on the top right, uh, and you would zig and zag the opposite direction to get all the way down to Kyoto and Osaka, Kyoto being over here and Osaka being down here. Uh, and so they can move around, you know, they can zig and zag even in different directions and different orientations because the important thing really is uh, the stations. The stations are the important thing here and the order of the stations. Uh, it's important that Odawara is the station along the road and then after Odawara comes Hakone and then after Hakone comes Mishima. And that even holds true today, right? You don't really need to know exactly what the road you're driving on or traveling on looks like. You're more concerned with where you're going, how long it will take to get there, where the next rest stop is, and how far away that is. So both of these maps obviously preserve the order of the stations. And then if we were to zoom in again, they would also represent the distance. So you would know how far along, if you're traveling in reality, or if you're just kind of traveling imaginatively, how far you'd have to go to get from one station to the next. And the last kind of fun thing to point out is how important Mount Fuji or how visible Mount Fuji is on this road. Mount Fuji is about, I don't know, maybe a third of the way. Uh, from present-day Tokyo on the road to Kyoto. Uh, and so you can see on the left, the map actually kind of centers itself on Fuji, occupying this place in the center. Uh, and then quite dramatically on the right, Fuji actually lifts up beyond uh, the margins or the supposed margins of the page and kind of erupts past it very dramatically. Uh, and so we can see how Fuji or it's the experience of Mount Fuji is also part of traveling along the road. So to close with our maps, I thought I'd zoom in here on the Tokaido Gyore Tsuguroku um, and explain it a bit more. It is a board game. Uh, you would actually uh, kind of gather around and roll six-sided die, uh, and you would start down here on the bottom right. You can see it starts here in this bridge, um, Nihonbashi, or the Bridge of Japan. It's a famous bridge in uh, Edo, and there's still a train station and bridge today in Tokyo called Nihonbashi. It's actually a station. You can see you literally kind of the use of perspective here, you're emerging and you're crossing the bridge and beginning your journey. And you'd roll a die and you would advance 
uh, based on the number you rolled up and around traveling along um, these stations here. Now, um, like any good game, there are rules. So you start at the bottom right, you have to wind your way up to the top left. Actually, this big character that you see here is telling you it's you're ascending up into the capital. Now, what I like is to win the game, it looks like judging from this, you have to roll a six, because there's actually punishments outlined. If you roll a one, you go back one space. If you roll a two, you go back two spaces, three, four, five, et cetera. Uh, so to actually win the game, you not only had to advance all the way up the Tolkaida or the Eastern Sea Road, you also had to roll a six upon getting to the capital to actually win. Um, it's a pretty simple game, but it's a game nonetheless. And I think the larger point here that's worth pointing out is that space, or the road has been turned into a site or space of play. Right? It's imagined as a site of play. Uh, and this is something we still do to this day. Um, Monopoly, the classic board game, right? You are literally buying up different spots on the boardwalk, on different parts of the road, real estate, so you're moving around. Um, but also if you are more kind of recent games, Ticket to Ride, you're literally building railroads across uh, different parts of United Europe or America, different parts of the world. And there is in fact, of course, coming full circle, there is a Tolkaido board game from the last few years uh, that you can experience as well, that of course takes into account all 53 of these stations. Now, there's plenty more going on with this map as well. We can note the use of perspective here, especially kind of see out of the bridge. Um, the color palette has changed since this is much later. This is from 1860. This is much later in the Tokugawa period. And of course, there's the uh, question of why there is essentially a procession, if you were to look, an armed procession crossing the road. The political context behind that is perhaps a story for another day, because this was just a taster. Uh, and our taste ends here. So just to wrap up, uh, thanks again for joining me. I hope you enjoy our little tour of a couple of maps from the Tokugawa period and that they give you an introduction to how people in Japan three or 400 years ago were thinking about space and imagining space and perhaps giving you some food for thought about how you do the same in your own context today. And it also gives you an idea of some of the sources you might be exposed to um, at a course in Cambridge, specifically if you were to take Japanese history here at the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. So I thank you very much for joining me.